Well, hello, I'm Matt Morton, the teaching pastor at Grace Creekside. Uh, Thank you for being willing to lead a group through the book of James this semester. We're excited about going through the book of James together. Uh, Hopefully you have your packet with you, which uh, I really am excited about. It's a beautiful design, awesome cover. Um, Hopefully you have it with you. We're gonna walk through James 1, 1 through 11. And I'll probably also just give a little bit of uh, detail regarding James as a whole as we walk through it. But my hope is to equip you to lead your group well this week uh, in the first passage of the book of James. So uh, let's dive in. Uh, As you're getting into your study this week, just like always, remember our studies are divided up into observation, interpretation, and application, kind of a a standard inductive Bible study format. So the first thing you're gonna wanna do is take your group through the observation process. Um, If you've got an hour in your group, I would suggest spending, really this first week, uh, I would suggest spending a lot of time on the observation portion because some of your folks may not have ever really done this before. And so the idea of what is an observation and how do I pull them out of the passage that's really important. So as you as you look here on, uh, it's page 16 of your packet, the passage is written out. There's space in between each line. Uh, really push people to think about, you know, an observation obviously is not the same as an interpretation. What you're looking at is simply what does the passage say? So an observation would be, this book is written by James, who is a servant of God and of Jesus. That's an observation. Uh, This book is written to the 12 tribes uh, who are dispersed abroad. Um, James begins with a command. That's an observation. So have your folks go through, and what I would do is just open up the group and say, toss out observations and gently guide people. If people give an interpretation or an application like we should always um, think about this, this, or this in the midst of trials, it's okay to say, uh, that comes from the passage, but what we're wanting to do right now is say say it more in terms of how James says it. James commands his readers to consider it all joy. Uh, that's a that's an observation. Uh, the time when they're supposed to consider it all joy is when they face various trials. Um, and another observation would be that these trials are various. There's different types of trials, uh, even though he doesn't specify what they are. So look for those types of observations. Look for connecting words like uh, therefore and for and but and those types of things that make transitions between uh, different sections. So spend, I don't know, maybe at least 20 minutes, I would say, 15, 20 minutes of your time this week in observation with your group. Go through the whole passage, just have them toss out observations. You may break it up like one through four and then five through eight and then nine through 11 or nine through 12 and have them observe that way. Um, One of the the, the main observation skills for this week is themes. Uh, Themes are often found by looking at repeated words. So if you look at the passage, you're gonna notice There's definitely some words repeated like trials, um, testing, faith is actually a repeated word, Um, doubt is actually a repeated word. There also seems to be uh, in the last part of the passage this idea of humility, uh, humble humiliation, but uh, perseverance, trials, faith, look at at those types of repeated words and those are really gonna help you identify the key themes. There's also an observation skill of figurative language. So uh, figurative language, metaphors, similes, anything that is uh, something is used as an image or a word picture to describe something else. So um, the word picture might be like, so for example, uh, in verse um, six, it says, he must ask in faith without doubting, without any doubting for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. That like right there, that's a clue that there's figurative language, that's a simile. Um, If it didn't have the like and it just said the one who doubts is the surf of the sea, that's obviously a metaphor, right? You're not literally the ocean, but you're you're like it, it's implied. Uh, So look for those types of things. That's a really obvious one that just stands out. 
And what I would encourage you to do as you think about those types of figures of speech is ask not only what is the figure of speech, but what is it meant to signify about its topic? So uh, the figure of speech is a concrete image, the surf of the sea. We all, we all can envision that, what it looks like. And what is, it, what is the abstract concept that it's trying to describe? So in this case, the abstract concept is, is the person's uh, doubt or unwillingness to really go all in on obeying God's wisdom. So like the surf of the sea, like it crashes and goes up and down and isn't really stable, that's what this person is like when they're doubting God's wisdom. So think about the symbol and what the symbol is referring to. And as y'all talk about figurative language, really push your groups to, to be uh, clear about not only what the symbol is, but what it's supposed to mean, what it's referring to. So those are your observation skills for this week. Um, like I said, I would spend 20 minutes um, of your time this first week on observation before you move into interpretation. Part of that is because most people who have read the Bible before are immediately gonna wanna dive into how, what is the interpretation of the difficult parts of this passage or how do I apply this passage to my life? What does it mean for me? Those are important questions, but we need to practice the discipline of not answering those questions until we literally say, what does this passage say? What is actually on the page before I say, what does it mean? Now, we've got several interpretation skills. Uh, the most important one this week is to use the context. Uh, as Howard Hendricks used to say, the three most important aspects of interpretation are context, context, and context. Uh, the context is always the most important aspect of understanding what the text is supposed to mean. So let me just kind of walk through our interpretation questions briefly. Um, and if you've got questions on any of these, you are welcome to reach out to me. You can email me, uh, mattmorton at grace-bible.org. I'd love to to answer any of those. So the first question ought to be relatively straightforward in verses two to four. What is the mindset that James instructs his readers to adopt in response to trials? Um, he says it, it's a command. He wants us to adopt a joyful mindset, not because we're suffering, but in light of what that suffering can produce in our lives, that as we endure trials, there's something that God can do inside of our hearts, that he can develop endurance, that we can bear up under the weight of suffering. But also there's these two words, and this gets into question two, perfect and complete. Perfect is, it, it says this word teleos, uh, which often is translated as mature. This is this idea that as we grow up, and we have more and more experiences of difficulty, we learn how to handle them in a way that is mature, in a way that our faith in God's goodness and God's power is deepened. That's that idea of, of complete. Your faith uh, becomes in practice what it's meant to be. What you believe um, begins to flesh itself out in your life. And that really leads to that second word, complete, um, and the idea of complete holokleroi, I think is how you pronounce the Greek word, uh, is this idea of integrity. There's a, there's a matching between the faith that I hold inside and the way that I express that faith in the real world. That's what we call integrity. I live what I believe. So as I endure trials and I trust God and I learn to rejoice in what God is doing, I become mature and I become complete so that I don't lack anything that I need to walk with God faithfully until the end of my life, until I see Jesus. So that ought to give you, uh, you know, at least um, a way to proceed with questions one and two, sort of an idea of where those questions are headed. Um, what is the connection? This is question three. What is the connection between wisdom in verse five and enduring trials? Why do we need wisdom? And how do we get it? Uh, the connection is that when we're undergoing trials, a lot of times we don't know what to do. We don't know how to respond. If you have a financial problem or you've got a relational problem or you've got a spiritual problem or a health problem, uh, not only do we not know how to fix it, but even in a deeper sense, we sometimes don't even know how we should uh, react to it well. 
How can I speak and uh, walk through this trial in a way that honors God and reflects my belief that Jesus Christ has defeated sin and death and suffering uh, at the cross and in his resurrection? How can I do this well? So we need wisdom. So James is saying, I want you to ask God for wisdom and God is ready to give it. Um, now he, he qualifies that and this is in uh, question four. What does it mean to ask for wisdom in faith and what does he mean by doubt? Um, I don't believe here that James is suggesting that we must have 100% certainty every time we pray. Uh, if that were the benchmark, nobody would, nobody would be able to pray and ever get anything from God. Instead, this word doubt, it's actually a Greek word, diakrino. It, it literally means to have a divided mind. The idea is that uh, I'm kind of not sure, even if I receive wisdom from God, whether I'll, I'll accept it, whether I'll obey it. So this is like when you ask somebody for advice and you're like, I wanna hear what you have to say before I decide whether or not I'm going to take your advice. Uh, James is saying we can't approach God with that type of attitude. We have to approach God in faith, acknowledging God always gives the right wisdom, always gives the right input from his word, through his spirit, through the community of believers, God will always give the right wisdom and he wants to give the right wisdom. So we need to approach him with a spirit of humility that says, God, no matter what you tell me to do, even if it costs me, I'm gonna obey you. That's, that's this distinction in the face of trials between faith and doubt. And, and, and the person who doubts, that's why he says, they're like a wave tossed by the seashore. I might listen to God, I might listen to some other non-Christian friend, I might listen to TikTok, like who knows what I may listen to. Uh, whatever it is that's going to give me wisdom that I like, that's what I wanna to listen to. That person is just kind of tossed around by the waves of the wind. He says, what I want you to do instead is have a rock solid assurance that the wisdom of God is what we need in the face of difficulties. And to say, God, I need your help, I need your wisdom, and I will obey you in the midst of that. Um, question five, uh, why does he introduce the topic of poverty and wealth and what perspective does he offer regarding uh, enduring the trial of poverty? Yeah, it does seem like a little bit of a left turn. He's been talking about trials and wisdom and all of a sudden he says, okay, let the poor man boast in his high position. The brother of humble, uh, humble circumstances is to glory in his high position. The rich man is to glory in his humiliation. Why all of a sudden are we talking about money when we were talking about trials? One reason is because there's no doubt that the audience James was writing to was mostly poor. They had money problems. And so their temptation was to say, uh, I, I, I'm not able to trust God and God's good, goodness because I don't have enough in the bank. I, I'm Literally, these folks were struggling to have enough food to eat, uh, to know where the next meal was going to come from. And so that's a hard position to be in. And so this is a particular trial. But I think where James takes us is also, if we were to zoom out a little bit, he's gonna say, when you're facing those kinds of trials, your temptation is to do one of two things. Either you look at how many resources you have uh, in an earthly sense. You say, you know, worst case scenario, I've still got my retirement account. Worst case scenario, I'm still really smart. I've still got lots of connections. I'm really talented. I'm whatever, I'm tall, I'm good looking, whatever I am that I can fall back on instead of trusting God. On the other hand, if we look and we go, I don't have many resources. You open up the bank account and there's 12 cents inside. Your temptation is to say, I'm sunk, woe is me. Uh, what James is saying is your real problem in the face of trial is not your, the, the presence or the lack of earthly resources. Your real problem is not actually whether or not you can pay the mortgage or your car payment or whether or not you can find another job. That's not your real problem. In the grand scheme of eternity, and he gets into this uh, in verses 10 and 11, in the grand scheme of eternity, your real problem is you're gonna die. No matter how much money you have, no matter how smart you are, no matter how, no matter how gifted you are, you're gonna die. And if you die apart from Jesus, uh, you're gonna be separated from God forever. But Jesus uh, died and rose again so that we can overcome death. So Jesus has offered a solution that we can lean into in these moments of trial when we say, I don't have any money and I need it. I don't have a job and I need it. 
my health is failing and I don't know what I'm going to do, we can take the long view and say, okay, for the poor person, you can boast that as Jesus rose from the dead, you will one day rise with him. You've been exalted in Christ to the extent that now your low status on this earth doesn't doom you. For the rich person, uh, which maybe some of us who, who are reading it uh, right now are studying it as well, just like it, uh, we have poor and rich people in the church, so did they. For the rich person, you can say, actually, what I need to boast in is not my money, not my bank account, not anything other than the fact that I'm identified with the death of Christ, that I belong to Jesus. That's what I boast in. And so my status as, uh, or high position in this world in light of what Jesus has done, that's not what I should glory in. I should glory or rejoice, if anything, in the fact that I know Jesus Christ. So both rich and poor, in the face of difficulties, in the face of the life we're walking through, are to identify themselves only with the death and resurrection of Jesus and trust only in the death and resurrection of Jesus. That's where he's going. Um, at the bottom of page 19, um, there is a... Uh, mountain moment uh, from Matthew chapter 6, and this is somewhat parallel to what James is talking about here. Jesus talks about um, not worrying, not being anxious, uh, because God provides. Uh, this is somewhat parallel to James chapter 1, where Jesus, in essence, says, I want you to remember in the face of your trials and difficulties, God sees you. All right? If God clothes the flowers, you can trust that he'll take care of you. Uh, if he takes care of the birds, right? He says, you don't see birds kind of gathering stuff in the barns. It's kind of a funny little image that Jesus uses where he, he goes, you don't see birds kind of building tiny little grain silos and, and gathering stuff in. They don't have to. They just trust that God will take care of them because they don't know enough to be worried. Um, and so he says, you and I ought to, in a sense, take that same kind of attitude toward our walk with God, that I can trust him that he'll provide, and he has provided in Jesus Christ through his death and resurrection. So hopefully that walks you through the uh, interpretation steps. Um, on application, what I would really encourage uh, as you go through all of these, um, it, it, I would encourage your group, and maybe even if you reach out to them ahead of time a bit, um, encourage a degree of vulnerability as you think about, even in your own life, why is it tough to respond to trials with joy? Um, as you lead the group, let me challenge you to lead out in sharing first on some of these more vulnerable moments. Um, as you think about your own life and try a trial that maybe you're walking through or that you have been through that you're willing to share, why is that difficult? And how can you begin to develop practices? That's question two that allow you to deepen your faith and then also refocus your hope in Jesus. So I'd encourage you to uh, step out if you can, be a little bit brave with your group because sometimes that vulnerability will breed more vulnerability in your group. So I'd encourage you in that respect. Um, help your group get to kind of one or two good principles from this passage about responding well to trial and then get them to a place where they can do that in their own walk with the Lord this week. So that ought to take us through the majority of the study. Um, like we often do in these studies, we also have an engage tool. And so uh, the idea for the engage tool, the every neighbor map is to begin to think through how might these passages, how might the book of James help me as I interact with people who don't know the Lord or people who uh, are struggling in their walk with the Lord. So if you've got time, to do that, I would encourage you to do that this week um, if you've got a moment at the end. Um, but I would I would make space, again, like I said, maybe 20 minutes this week for observation. You're probably going to spend about at least 10 minutes, 15 minutes just in, in chatting and in prayer and getting to know everybody. Maybe another 20 minutes in observation, maybe another 20 in interpretation, and then spend the remainder of your time on application and closing in prayer. So hopefully that gives you a good start for week one. I'm excited again that you've chosen to lead and uh, I look forward to hearing how your groups go. Have a great week.